All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back um, to do another webinar today. Uh, today, we'll continue with our classes on the introduction to Chinese herbal medicine, and we'll cover three of the smaller chapters today. And those two chapters are Shen coming herbs, uh, herbs that open the sensory orifice, and also the astringent herbs. Um, so we'll take about an hour and spend approximately 20 minutes for each of these chapters. All right, and we'll begin with the Shen coming herbs, okay? And uh, I think most of you who are TCM practitioners obviously know exactly what Shen is. Um, Shen, um, the closest translation in English is spirit, but I think it really goes uh, much more beyond that. Uh, this is basically, Shen is something that describes our mind, our emotions, and also our spirit. You know, so a lot of it is uh, intangible. It's basically how you are, who you are inside, okay? And what happened is uh, when the outside influence, you know, whether it's stress, anxiety, uh, slowly start to affect the Shen, start to affect your emotion, affect your state of mind, and affect your spirit, then basically that's when uh, the person is said to have Shen disturbance. And these are the herbs that help to calm the Shen and basically restore the per person back to their optimal health. All right. And generally speaking, um, two main uh, issues when we look at Shen disturbance are heart related and also liver related. And primarily because liver controls our emotion and heart controls our Shen. Okay, so generally speaking, what happened is in the beginning, uh, when someone first have uh, issues that may trigger stress or anxiety, uh, for liver is first affected, all right? So let's say, um, you know, in the last 20 years or so, there have been three main events that cause shin disturbance, um, pretty much for everybody affected. The first one is obviously 9-11, okay? So that was a very, uh, traumatic and also shocking event for everybody in the United States and for that matter, uh, the whole world as well. So in one morning, in one day, uh, the world changed, right? So a lot of people have a lot of anxiety disorders and you know, stress dis you know, conditions. You know, so usually uh, liver is first affected because liver controls the emotions. But what happened is after a while, uh, one or two things may happen. One is the liver chi may become stagnant and start to create or generate more fire. And then as fire rises upwards, it will then disturb the shen. You know, so at that point, shen is just disturbed. You know, so the patient tends to have more emotional issues. Um, their state of mind is disturbed. You know, they tend to be very um, either hyper or hypo or, you know, basically they cannot stay focused for very long. And their spirit as well. Okay, so liver chi is uh, stagnant first, that creates fire, and then when the fire rises upwards, um, it disturbs the heart and causes shen disturbance. And another thing that may happen is that initially, again, right, so when the stressful event causes anxiety and stress, what may also happen is these stress uh, start out as excess because the patient underneath is still healthy. But what happens is over time, okay, instead of heat or liver chi stagnation create heated fire, liver chi stagnation can also affect this person's well-being. You know, so they're always worried, they cannot sleep very well, they cannot rest very well. Uh, so they end up with blood deficiency, you know. So what starts out as excess slowly wears on the body and they become more and more deficient, okay. And once the body becomes deficient and the blood becomes deficient, then the blood cannot properly nourish the heart. So the patient may also have shin disturbance that way, all right. So when you look at shin disturbance, you have to look at the start, which is usually start out with liver chi stagnation and that may turn into liver heat and fire causing shen disturbance, or that may turn into blood deficiency and causing shen disturbance. All right, so shen disturbance by itself just means your shen is affected, but you still have to look at what caused it and whether this person is having more excess signs and symptoms or more deficiency signs and symptoms. All right, so the general signs and symptoms are restlessness, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, forgetfulness, excessive dreaming, um, possibly epilepsy and seizure, mania, free of fry, palpitations, and so on, okay? And of course, 
um, feel the pulse and look at the tongue. You know, generally that will give you good indications of whether the patient is having a more excess type shin disturbance or deficiency type shin disturbance. All right, and from a well, as we mentioned, shin is a very Chinese term, right, and it encompasses quite a bit. Uh, from a biomedical disease perspective, uh, some of the uh, disease condition that corresponds well with shin disturbance include insomnia, various type of emotional, psychological, and psychiatric disorders, and then in severe cases, seizure and epilepsy. Okay, and like we mentioned earlier, obviously when we look at these patients, we have to look uh, and find out what the pattern is. So this is our pattern differentiation or differential diagnosis. Okay, so uh, it's not uh, it's not enough to just give the pa a formula or a, form a herbal formula that comes to Shen. You know, and in Western medicine, a lot of times that may be the case. Um, things like Valium, uh, Carnapin or you know, some sedative and hypnotic basically is somewhat of a one-size-fits-all type of formula for patients who have stress, anxiety, psychological disorders. But in Chinese medicine, differential diagnosis is very important. And the reason is because those that have the excess type of shin disturbance may need to be calmed down with herbs that help to anchor their shin, you know, basically uh, push downwards, okay? And those that uh, have shin disturbance from a lot of stress and worry for a long period of time have underlying deficiency. So you need to uh, tonify them and support them from underneath. Okay, so while the symptom may seem like they are the same, the treatment protocol is going to be quite different. All right, excess type overall, uh, once again, have a lot of heat and fire, excess type of signs and symptoms. So generally speaking, if you have a good feel, okay, uh, it shouldn't, t shouldn't be too hard to distinguish the two. All right, so with excess, once again, you have irritability, anxiety, restlessness, you know, um, insomnia, and so on. Okay, so red eyes is a good indication of excess condition, so it's yellow tongue cold and rapid uh, pause. All right, so these are all the indications uh, that the patient have an excess type of shin disturbance. And then vice versa, uh, those that have shin disturbance that's characterized by deficiency, have maybe stress, anxiety, just the same, but underneath they have dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitation, fearfulness, forgetfulness, nice sweats, and they tend to be very fearful, they tend to be very jumpy, they get scared easily and frightened very easily. And tongue is usually pale, and pulse is really generally weak and dirty. All right, so if you would step back and look at the overall picture, in addition to what they tell you, what they complain of, look at the tongue, uh, take their pulse, look at the signs and symptoms and so on. Generally speaking, it's fairly simple and easy to differentiate between the excess and deficiency type of shin disturbance. Okay, uh, TCM um, functions of these herbs and formula is mainly to start out with herbs to soothe the qi, to treat liver qi stagnation and calm the shen, and then of course if they have underlying deficiency, you have to nourish in and also calm the shen. Uh, Western pharmacological effects tend to be more simple and straightforward, meaning uh, most of these drugs tend to have a one directional type of effect. So they are sedative, they are hypnotic, they are anxiolytic, they are antidepressant. You know, by and large, they tend to be suppressing type of drugs. Okay, and the idea is um, whatever that causes them to be uneasy, you suppress their central nervous system, you suppress their feelings, their thoughts, their emotions, and so on. So what happened with the drug is that it generally worked very well right in the beginning, um, or as long as the drug is still working. But what happened is they don't really solve the problem. You know, um, while they're on the drug, you know, um, the emotions and feelings are numb or masked. And then once they figure the drug wears out, they're back to where they were before, okay? Uh, and another problem on a long-term basis is that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of these drugs, sedative and hypnotic, tend to cause tolerance and dependence, all right? So if you take them for too long, and eventually you get hooked on it, 
Okay, and at that point, um, the original condition of why you need the drug is no longer there, but you still need to take the drug. And if you stop using it, there's usually a rebound effect. And the rebound is characterized by hyperactivity. So they may have rebound insomnia, rebound restlessness, they have rebound uh, hyperactivity, and so on and so forth. And in fact, uh, some may even have rebound and then increase the risk, increase risk of seizure and convulsion. All right, so short-term use is okay. Uh, Long-term, it's probably best to identify what the cause is uh, and try to uh, either alleviate the cause or at least come to peace with it. And what I mean by come to peace with it is, um, you know, if you are at a living in a fear, okay, because of 9-11 or because of right now, because of COVID-19, then make sure you learn everything you can, let's say about COVID-19. You know, you learn the possibilities, the risk, you know, learn how to, you know, prevent it, how to minimize it, and basically accept that this is part of the risk for where we are today. You know, and uh, you do the best you can, and then um, realize uh, you have done everything you can, okay? Um, so if you can, you know, uh, learn everything you can and come to peace with it, and then if you need to, you know, uh, take additional measures um, to reduce the risk. Generally speaking, that goes a long way um, to ease the fear, to calm the shame. All right, so let's look at some herbs and some formulas first for treating the excess type of shin disturbance. And obviously the two that we generally use the most are the combination of longgu and muli. Longgu is originally translated as dragon bone or osteoconus, you know, but the most recent edition of PPRC, which is Pharmacopoeia from People's Republic of China, changed the pharmaceutical name to Fossilia Osis Mastodi. Um, basically, it's a more accurate name because osteoconus basically means dragon bone. But what happened is this is not really bones of dragons, right? This is basically the fossilized bones from the large mammals, okay? I think I have a slide that describes this. Oh yeah, here it is. So these are the fossilized and mineralized bones from the uh, large mammals, okay? And I guess somehow they figure out um, the primary mammals or primary ones are the mastodons. These are the old um, elephant-like creatures that are no longer um, on Earth today, they, they are extinct, okay? But in addition to mastodon, you also have rhinoceros, um, hipparion, deer, moose, oxen, horses, cows, you know, uh, and so on. All right, so basically, that's what this particular herb or animal substance or mineral, whatever you want to call it, but that's what this substance is. It's a fossilized bones from the large uh, mammals. All right, so historically, because of this herb being a fossilized bone, it's heavier, it's described to have an effect to anchor the shin, to calm the liver uh, wind and calm the liver yawn. Okay, so this is something that's frequently used to treat the liver rising and disturbing the shin type of conditions. Okay, and in addition, it also has a secondary or tertiary effect to prevent and consolidate, consolidate the leakage of body fluids. But generally speaking, most of the time, this herb or this substance is used to uh, anchor the shen uh, and calm down the liver um, for that purpose. All right. Um, the pharmacological effect description is it has sedative and anti-convulsant effect. Okay, so interestingly, this herb is able to help to reduce spontaneous physical activity, reduce the time needed to fall asleep, and also increase the total sleeping time. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't make um, the subject or a patient to become more sleepy. Okay, so it's quite different from the Western sedative and hypnotics because if you take those sleeping pills or if you take the alien type of drugs, generally you become very tired, sleepy, and groggy, even you know, eight, 12 hours later. But with this particular herb, some part can help to, for the patient to go to sleep without necessarily making you sleepy. All right, and then in addition, it also potentiates the effect of barbiturates, in this case, pentobarbital, once again, to induce sleeping and also counter the effect of the drug that induces convulsion. So it definitely does have some effect on the central nervous system. All right, one important thing to watch out with this herb is the possible heavy metal contamination. 
Okay, so what happened is in any countries in the world where there's either a volcanic eruption, okay, or uh, perhaps uh, industrial pollution, then what happened is a lot of the heavy metals that gets spewed out from the volcano or from pollution of industrialized uh, countries or factories, then these things get into the soil and therefore they pollute whatever that's in the soil. And therefore you have to watch out for certain plants uh, if they grow over there. And in this case you also have to watch out for the fossilized bone, mineral, bone minerals that may be uh, contaminated. You know? So this would be what's called a certificate of analysis. And what you see here Okay, is that these are the tests for the heavy metals. All right, you have lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury, which are the four main heavy metals that are potentially harmful for, for humans. Right, so um, you, ha you have to test them to make sure the level is below the safety threshold, so it's not going to cause any harm. And by the way, you know, it's never going to be completely zero because uh, heavy metals are part of Earth. It's always going to be there. It's just a matter of the, th you know, the limit. And if you see something called ND, okay, which is over here, that just means not detected. Okay? All right, and uh, the number one formula that uses um, Longgu and Muli, Dragon Ball and Oyster Shell in the formula, is this formula called Tai Hu Jia Longgu Muli Tang, which is Pupuan plus Dragon Ball and Oyster Shell decoction. Uh, this is really one of the best formulas to treat patients that start out with liver tea stagnation, that turns into liver heat and fire, that turn into shen disturbance. Okay, so this is a great formula to treat the excess type of stress, anxiety, shen disturbance, and all those related emotional, psychological, psychiatric type of disorders. Okay, TCM description is a little bit vague. It's, um, it's described as a formula to treat disorder in all three yang stages, tai yang, yang ming, and sao yang. So that really doesn't mean a lot, but originally how, how this came about is if the patient has an exterior condition, such as a tai yang condition, but is mistreated with a purgative or downward draining formula, and therefore leading the exterior condition to move inwards to yang ming or sao yang stage, and therefore it's now stuck in tai yang, yang ming, and sao yang. Um, so today, there is basically nobody that fit that exact description. But what happened is, this basically means it's a condition that whatever it is, start off from the exterior, it moves interior, it's kind of stuck in between, and the patient is not getting better, it's not getting worse, and they're just kind of living with this disorder. Okay, so if you have patient of that, with that kind of disorder, and it tends to be more central nervous system related, psychologically related, brain related, emotion related, psychological related, and so on, then this is a great formula to use. All right, so if you look at the biomedical uh, diseases or indications, you have neurosis, neurotic palpitation, nervousness, anxiety, hysteria, neurasthenia, insomnia, depression, schizophrenia, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it does have a very wide uh, indication applications. All right, and once again, you also have to watch out for the formulas because once again, formulas as dragon bone and oyster shell, both of which may have higher levels of heavy metal. So once again, uh, check for, or ask your herbal supplier for certificate of analysis, specifically for lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. All right, so that's the herb for excess type of shen disturbance. If the patient comes in and they have a deficiency type of shen disturbance, so these are the patients that have had the condition for a while, right? So over time, you start to wear, out, wear on them. And this is very common you know, during the COVID-19 period, especially for the healthcare workers, but it could be for everybody else as well. So what happened is they work eight or 10 hours a day, they are under great stress, you know, um, every day they are at work, every hour they are at work. So initially, uh, the adrenaline kicks in uh, and they are able to fight it, you know, so they, have this, they, they get into the fight and fly type of mentality and they may have some liver cheese stagnation. But over time, what happens is eventually they start to wear on them. Uh, you cannot work this hard for this long 
without suffering from some deficiency. So a few weeks later, uh, maybe a month or two later, they start to show a lot of underlying deficiency and the stress is still there. So at this point, uh, if you need to treat them, you need to switch gear and start to use the herb that nourish the shen to help to treat the shen disturbance. So Xuan Zao Ren is actually one of the best herbs for that purpose. It nour nourishes the heart and calms the shen and also secondary effect is to stop sweating. Okay, and once again, the pharmacological effect is relatively simple and straightforward. Sedative, hypnotic, anxiolytic, antidepressant, uh, neuroprotective, anti-seizure, and anti-convulsant. All right, so our primary application for this herb here is probably sedative, hypnotic, anxiolytic, and to some extent, antidepressant. So basically help to treat the emotional, psychological disorders. All right, and interestingly, um, the herb has obviously many different active compounds, all right? And what these two studies shows is that if you use the water base, okay, to extract the herb, you end up with compounds that have stronger antidepressant effect, okay? If you use the ethanol, okay, if you use the tinctures, then what happens is you, have, you extract out herbs with stronger anxiolytic effect. Okay, so uh, antidepressant effect generally means the herb have a little bit more lifting effect because generally speaking, when the patient is depressed, their TCM presentation is more withdrawn, more deficiency. And when the patient has a lot of anxiety, you know, they are generally a little bit more hyper. So the ethanol perhaps will extract out more uh, fast soluble compounds, so the herb has a stronger anxiolytic effect. Okay, so that's quite interesting. And if you are looking for both effect, then one possibility is to dry fry the herb with some ethanol or some alcohol or wine and dry fry it so it helps to dissolve the alcohol soluble components and then after that, uh, cook it in water and extract. That way you get the both, get both out of the herbs. All right. One other thing that's very important is uh, it's very important to dry fry and crush open the seeds. Uh, this way, uh, once the seed, the outside shell cracks open, water goes inside and you maximize the surface area and you can extract much more of the active ingredient. All right, so this herb, the caution here, is in contrast to long and muli, dragon ball and oyster shell, swan zhao in fact will make the patient a bit drowsy and sedated. All right, so if you use this herb, especially at a large dose, then make sure you warn the patient to be careful with driving and operating machinery because you don't want them to do something that if they are uh, compromised in their ability to do it safely, then get into an accident. All right, formula-wise, um, this formula takes the single herb as a chief herb and also its name. So we have Xuan Zhao Zhen Tang Sour Jujube Decoction. And the formula is pretty simple. You have Xuan Zhao Zhen, Chuan Xiong, Bethesticum, or Chuan Xiong, Fuli, Emporia, Zimu, and Nimurina, and Gan Cao, Galaceriza, or Ligurish. Okay, so it's a very simple formula. Primarily, we use the Shui Shen Disturbance with underlining lower blood deficiency and also deficiency heat rising. So like I mentioned, it's for a patient that have had the stress and anxiety for a long period of time that you wore them out, all right, to a point where they had liver blood deficiency and they have blood deficiency not able to nourish the heart and nourish the shen, and that's why they have shen disturbance with irritability, insomnia, palpitation, you know, those type of signs and symptoms. Uh, Western indications include insomnia, nocturnal emission, neurasthenia, menopausal signs and symptoms, excessive worrying, and so on. All right, and then one other herb that's important is an herb called xie cao. Uh, xie cao is basically valerian root. So you do see this quite a bit in the OTC uh, market, in pharmacies or health food stores. And basically this herb also has an effect to calm the heart, tranquilize the heart and calm the shen. So it does work very well. Similarly, it has sedative, anxiolytic, antidepressant type of pharmacological effects. All right, so the herb and its active compound, valeric acid, have anti-convulsant effect and has synergistic effect along with the drugs such as clonazepam and phenytoin to help to treat, treat convulsion. 
All right. So here are some of the more contemporary formulas uh, for treating the shame disorder. This formula is called CAMIA, so it's basically an extra strength formula for treating stress, anxiety, uh, type of shame disturbance disorders. All right. So this formula has prime both herbs to treat the excess type and also some herbs that help to nourish the underlying deficiency as well. So the herbs for excess obviously are the long Muli that we mentioned earlier and the herbs that help to nourish the deficiency is Xuan Zhaozhen. Okay, so basically it helps to treat a little bit of both and also a patient that may be somewhere in the transition. Okay, because when they start out with excess and later on they become deficiency, it's not a one day type of event, it's something that changes gradually. So it goes high and then over time slowly become low. Okay, so it's a slow and gradual transition. And this formula is called COMZZZ, you know, so basically once again, for a patient that has stress and anxiety type of problem, but also have a lot of trouble sleeping at night. Okay, so some herbs in here specifically help to calm their shed and help them sleep better at night. Okay, and then Shisandra ZZZ is also something to help with insomnia, but most of the herbs in this case are nourishing herbs. Okay, so this is for somebody who have had the condition for a long time and they're basically, the underlying pattern is mostly deficiency. All right, so the excess part phase is long gone. It's mostly deficiency and that's what this formula is for. All right, so that's the uh, first of the three chapters we'll talk about today on the shed disturbance. The next one is oil face opening herbs. And this formula, these herbs um, are quite important. Uh, they are not used that much, but when you need to use them, uh, they are quite important and also they are quite effective. Um, and in Chinese herbs, these are the herbs that, that are described as herbs that have effect to open orifice or tai chiao. So what happened is um, obviously your brain controls your five senses and your five senses, senses are your you know, ability to see, to hear, to smell, to touch, and to taste, right? So it could be the sense individually that's affected or it could be the brain that's affected, all right? So this formula is able to open up those senses open up the brain to help to treat either the sensory function disorders or the brain function disorder itself. Okay, so basically all of those things. All right, so uh, in severe cases, obstruction of the sensory orifice may lead to altered consciousness. Okay, so generally speaking, most patients that we see are not quite that severe. They may start out with, you know, a lot of people these days complain of loss of taste and also a loss of smell, you know, as a result of viral infection. Okay, so that could be something you can treat with herbs that open the sensory orifice and herbs that move the blood. But generally speaking, like I mentioned, you start with um, a decrease or loss of the five senses or you might have, you know, brain disorders. Okay, and from a biomedical perspective, um, close sensory orifice or affected sensory orifice correspond to a large, wide variety of biomedical diseases, including infectious disease, neurological condition, cardiovascular condition, respiratory, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's not necessarily something that directly affects the brain, such as neurological. It can be secondary due to infection, okay, or other type of inflammatory conditions. Okay, there are a few herbs, that single herbs, that belong in the Shen op opening uh, category. Uh, but there's really only one that's frequently used today, and that one is Si Chang Pu, a chorus. Okay, so this herb has a function to open the orifice and eliminate the phlegm or vaporize the phlegm and also open the orifice, calms the heart and the shen. Okay, so basically it helps to open the orifice, calms the shen and vaporize or el eliminate the phlegm or possibly the blastasis that cause or block the sensory orifice. So if, it, if it's phlegm, then C sample is a better choice. If it's blood stasis that block the sensory orifice, then you do need to add additional herbs that move the blood and eliminate blood stasis. 
Okay, and what happened is, uh, and I have had this um, hunch for a while that herbs that open the sensory orifice, I had a hunch that somehow, one way or the other, they must get through the blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, uh, it's very difficult, if, if possible at all, to treat the actual brain disease. Right? So blood-brain barrier is the, you know, uh, ver a very tight junction that screens uh, and prevents most things from getting into the brain. So basically only the most vital substance gets through. Okay? And what happened is Si Chang Pu helps to increase that permeability of the blood-brain barrier and open the tight junctions. So when the brain actually suffers from uh, neurological disorders or brain disorder, si shampoo can be used as a guiding herb to open up the tight junction and allow the rest of the herbs to go in, go in and treat the disorder. Okay, so si shampoo itself is a great guiding herb that opens the gate and let the rest of the herb go in and do their thing. All right. Pharmacological effect-wise, it has anti-seizure, anti-epileptic, anti-convulsion effect to treat seizure, epilepsy, and convulsion. It also has cognitive effect and neuroprotective effect. So basically, it will help to improve the cognition, to improve memory, to improve memory recall, to improve thinking, rationale, and so on. And it does that in part by protecting the neurons from um, external damages. Okay, whether it's chemical or physical. And then lastly, it also has sedative, hypnotic, and antidepressant effect. All right. And earlier I mentioned that there are other herbs within this category, right? There's Se Xiang, which is the musk. Uh, there is Bing Pian, which is Borneo, An Xi Xiang Benzo Benzoinum, and also Su Xiang Styrex. And as far as I know, uh, these herbs are really not used, and in some cases not even allowed, in the Western countries, okay? Se uh, Xiang is the, the secretion for the musk deer, and this is, musk deer is usually protected, you know, so they don't, they don't do this anymore. And then being Pian Borneo is available in China, they, can, they still use it, but in the U.S., uh, it's not allowed for oral ingestion. You can apply it topically, but not orally. And the last two um, is hardly ever used, so I don't know if they are available at all. So basically, that boils down to uh, just Sangpu that is frequently used. So if you need an herb to open the sensory orifice, that's basically your best and only choice. All right. And earlier I mentioned that a lot of time what happened is uh, a lot of people have uh, closed sensory orifice in part because of external trauma. Uh, concussion would be the best example, right? Concussion from physical injury, from car accident, from football players, and so on. You know, so when that happens, that is definitely blood stasis, you know, not a phlegm type of condition. Uh, phlegm would be more along the line of high cholesterol, you know, maybe somebody with atherosclerosis or high cholesterol levels, and then that blocks the blood circulation to the brain. Okay, but in this case, if it's an acute onset, it's mostly blood stasis. So this will be the best formula to use if it's a blood stasis related type of problem. So this formula is called Tong Chao Huo Xue Tang, unblock the orifice and invigorate the blood decoction. So as you can see, this is a composition from the classic formula. You have a lot of herbs that are blood moving herbs, including Si Sao, uh, Peony Rubra, which is a red peony, Chuan Xiong, which is the gestacum, Taozen, and Honghua, which are perscribed condiments. You know, so basically this is a formula with a lot of blood moving herbs, and the guiding herb to direct it to the brain is Se Xiang, that's the original formulation. But today, generally speaking, Si Chang Pu, a chorus is used instead. All right, so this formula is generally for a more acute case of blood stasis, concussion type of disorders. Okay, mostly for uh, upper parts of the body, specifically the head. Okay, and these are the Western indications. Concussion, cerebrovascular accident, vascular headache, and so on. 
Okay, and then this formula is um, for a patient that have had the condition for a while. So maybe they started out with concussion, maybe they have Alzheimer's, maybe they have dementia or Parkinson's. So what happened is one way or the other, you know, you have phlegm stagnation, you have blood stasis, you have lack of blood circulation to the brain, and then over time, with lack of blood supply, lack of nutrients, the brain, the nerve cell starts to slowly go through atrophy, and that's where they have, you know, forgetfulness. They have, um, um, they, they lose their long-term memory. They lose, you know, maybe their ability to remember to do things, and so on and so forth. Okay, so when they have those conditions. Uh, the formula called NeuroPlus is designed exactly for that. Uh, basically, it has the blood moving herbs to help to increase blood circulation to the blood. It also has a lot of herbs that tonify the kidney gene, and kidney gene basically represents your bone marrows and also represents your brain. Okay, so this is to help the bone marrows and your brain to recover and restore its normal functions. It's somewhat of a large fun formula, and this is a formula actually originally developed uh, by Dr. Zhang in Tianjin Hospital. Uh, and what happened is in Tianjin, Tianjin is one of the biggest ports, industrial ports in China. So what happened was there was a lot of pollution, and a lot of patients that suffer from Alzheimer's and dementia as a result of pollution. So this is a formula they found to work best uh, to help to stabilize, to stop the deterioration for these patients who have a long-term neurodegenerative disorders. Okay, and one other thing is it's also used for tr treating post-stroke sequela. You know, so some herbs do move the blood and restore the physical function as well as the neurological sensory functions. So it's actually a very, very good formula uh, for all those indications that I mentioned earlier. All right, so these are the uh, Shen, Oh, the, these are the OFS opening herbs, and, um, and once again, you can use it to treat all the indications that we mentioned earlier. Okay, another one is Circulation San Jiao or Circulation SJ. Um, this is more actually for the rest of the body, right? SJ is for, stands for San Jiao, which is your upper jaw, middle jaw, and lower jaw. Okay, so if you have blood stasis all throughout the body, then this would be the more appropriate formula to use. Um, the one from two slides earlier, Tong Chiao Huo Xie Tang is more specific for the head, and that's why it has Si Chang Pu or Se Xiang in the formula. All right, and the last chapter for today is chapter 18, the astringent herbs, okay? Uh, astringent herb, um, these herbs or herbs in this category uh, really don't have a very simple way to describe them from a Chinese perspective or from a Western perspective. And the reason is because they actually have a wide range of effect to treat a wide range of conditions. Okay, so let's start out with a simple description and then gradually build on that as we go. Okay, so these herbs, astringent herbs are described as herbs that have effect to bind, to retain, to restrain, and prevent the loss of precious body fluids and substances. So what that means is, generally speaking, uh, these herbs are used for patients who have, over a long period of time, suffer from chronic illness. So their body starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And their different organs and organ systems uh, also start to get weaker. So as the organ and organ system get weaker, they slowly start to lose their proper functions. All right. So at this point, generally speaking, if you catch it early, the your treatment would be to use the tonic herbs to help to support, to supplement, to build up the function. Okay. But sometimes what happens is the patient is so weak and so deficient, okay, they can't even absorb the herbs to correct their problem. Okay, so in that case, what you need to do is you need to treat the symptom first before you treat the cause. Okay, so astringent herb is basically that. It helps to uh, stop the bleeding, it stop the deterioration first. Okay, so you can at least stabilize the condition. Before then, you can use tonic herb to treat the underlying cause. So what happens is depending on the organ, depending on the organ system, and how weak and how deficient they are, these astringent herbs will then retain, will bind, will stabilize all those organ systems. So if the lung is really weak and deficient, the patient may have a very weak perspiration, breathing, and coughing, 
right? So a stringent oil can be used to temporarily stabilize the condition. If your digestive system is so weak that it's not able to digest food and reabsorb the water, then what happens is everything comes right out, right? So they will have a frequent watery stool, diarrhea, with a lot of undigested food. Okay, if their urinary tract is very weak and uh, deficient, so that would be the kidney yang deficiency, then what happens is they cannot control the urination. So these patients would have frequent urination, would have nocturnal urea, they have um, uh, spontaneous urination and so on, or nocturnal emission. Okay, or if their uh, reproductive system is really weak, then the women or the men, women may have profuse menstruation, and the men may have spermatoria or nocturnal emission. Okay, so basically whenever you have a long-term chronic illness characterized by slow and consistent leakage of fluid or function, then you can use or consider using astringent herbs to help to stabilize the condition and stop the deterioration. And once the deterioration you know, uh, is stopped and the condition is stabilized, then you switch gear and start to slowly and gently, gently tonify the underlying deficiency. All right, so let's now go through a few herbs that are uh, in the astringent nerve category. All right, the first one is Ruizi, which is a Shishandra berries. Uh, this herb primarily is, has a stringent herb, uh, a stringent effect on the lung and also on the kidney. Okay, so when it astringes the lung, you will help to retain the body fluids, you will help to restrain excessive or spontaneous sweating. And when it astringes the kidney, you will help to st stop the leakage of fluids, uh, such as leakage in the form of urine or leakage in the form of sperm. Okay, and then one other function is to tranquilize the heart and calm the shin. And then ume, fructus ume, also has effect as an astringent herb for the lung and also for the intestines. So it inhibits or stops the leakage of lung qi and also binds the intestines to stop uh, diarrhea. And then its other or secondary effect is also to treat parasitic infections. So this is a parasite mostly in the intestines. And then Wu Beizi is Gala Chinensis. And this is an interesting herb. I, you know, I don't know if you realize this or not. This is actually uh, not an herb and not an animal. It's basically an insect that, paras paras that parasitizes the plant and then secretes the wax on the plant. And it's the wax that's the gall, or in this case, it's called the Gala Chinensis. All right, so this herb is an astringent herb, or this substance is an astringent herb, and it has effect on both the lung, the intestine, or in the lung, the intestine, and also the kidney. So it helps to astringe and contain the leakage of lung qi. It binds the intestines to treat diarrhea, and also consolidate kidney gene, okay, to treat leakage of, in the form of urine, and also sperm, okay. One other function is to stop bleeding. Okay, Hertzi is fructose chibila. Uh, it has effect to restrain the lung qi and also to bind the, di bind the intestine to stop diarrhea. Okay, the last herb here, uh, you, can, you can say it's uh, two main functions, are both as an astringent herb and also as a tonic herb. Okay, so it basically does both at the same time and their these two functions are probably equally potent. Okay, so some herb book will classify this as an astringent herb, while others may classify it as a tonic herb. Anyways, it helps to tonify the liver and the kidney, and also retain the gene and also the body fluids. Okay, so you do see this quite a bit in both formula that tonify the kidney uh, and liver in, but also at the same time uh, to restrain uh, the fluids and the acids. Okay. And overall, uh, this is a TCM description, right? These are bind, retain, restrain, and prevent the loss of these bodily fluids. And in Western biomedical term, what happened is, these are primarily influence or treat disease that there is such physical weakness 
or weakness of the organ systems, whether it's respiratory tract or digestive tract or genital urinary tract and so on, in which the weakness then translates to the hypo functions of these organs. Okay, so like we mentioned, depending on which system that we're talking about, then the lack of function and the symptom are what these are basically treat. So once again, that could be the respiratory tract, that could be the digestive tract, it could be the blood, urinary system, or, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's why uh, these herbs have a wide range of therapeutic effects. It's, it doesn't act or work on just one system of the body or one part of the body. They actually work on many dis different systems of the body. So pharmacological effect wise, they have a stringent effect. That's more of a TCM description. You know, in Western medicine, there's really no such term as a stringent effect. But the others are something that's frequently used, right? This anti-diarrhea effect, basically to stop diarrhea. Antitussive is to suppress cough. Hemostatic is to stop bleeding. And antidiuretic is obviously to stop or slow down the excessive urination. All right, so once again, you have many different herbs all have these pharmacological effects. This herb, unfortunately, is not something that we can use. Uh, this is in suke, basically this is the husk of the opium poppy. Okay, so this is something that we use historically in China as an herb, as an astringent herb. But today, uh, because the husk gives rise to many opioids, uh, codeine, morphine, and so on, um, obviously uh, this becomes a controlled substance. But in any case, the opioids have two main effects. One is to slow down the intestinal peristalsis, and the other is to dry up the intestines. So what happens is they do have very strong effect to treat diarrhea. And in fact, if you look at the over-the-counter drug Imodium, okay, it's actually an opioid, except its primary effect is on the intestine. It has no effect on the brain, or very, very little effect on the brain, so it doesn't give you a high, it doesn't really pain. So uh, along that line, what happened is Insuke also has that effect. So what happened is it's primarily classified as an astringent herb, but it has anti-diarrheal effect to delay the gastric entering to slow down the peristaltic movement to drive the intestine. So basically it's a very effective herb to treat diarrhea. Right? These next two herbs, Si, Si, and Yu, Yu, Liang, they are basically the mineral herbs. They are the inorganic salts. And what happened is they have a very strong binding effect. Okay, so in this case, it's literally the binding effect, you know, where they physically attach to others. So in this case, uh, these two herbs can be used as a uh, anti-poison type of herb, like activated charcoal. So the patient swallows anything that's poisonous or anything that's toxic, then you can ingest these two herbs at the same time or immediately thereafter, and the herb will bind to those poisons form a insoluble complex and flush them out of the system, okay? Or if the patient has um, ingested poison, not poisonous, but rotten or spoiled food, right? Where there's a lot of bacteria or bacterial endotoxins that's causing a bacterial or dysentery, you know, travelers diarrhea type of condition. Then what happens is these two, are, once again, will bind to the bacteria, to the bacterial endotoxin, and flush them out of the system or the GI tract and therefore help to stop diarrhea that way. Okay, so how these two herbs stop diarrhea is completely different than the first herb in Suke, even though they are all classified as anti-diarrheal herbs or astringent herbs. Okay, there's one other herb called Wu Bei Zi Ga Chinensis. So like we mentioned, this is basically the mineral or the wax, or this is the wax. Uh, from the insects, right? So what happened is uh, this wax, once you take it, uh, it, the tannic acid is converted to gallic acid. And what it does then is it forms a prote protective layer inside your gastrointestinal mucous membrane to minimize the irritation from the bacteria, from the endotoxin, from whatever the patient ingested that's irritating the gastrointestinal membrane or the mucous membrane and causing diarrhea that way. All right, so uh, this could be maybe some patient that ate a lot of 
spicy, a lot of um, pungent food, okay, that cause GI irritability. Maybe patients that take NSAIDs on a regular basis, and NSAIDs basically destroys the prostaglindin or the mucus lining, and therefore cause ulcer. Anyways, you know, whatever the cause may be, if it causes irritation to or removes or damage the mucus lining or the GI tract, then Wu Bei Zi would be a good herb to use because it then helps to form a protective coating to treat diarrhea to protect the GI tract. All right? And then uh, if the patient has coughing, Right? So once again, we have a lot of astringent herbs that help to astringe and retain the lung qi to help to treat cough. Okay, so in this case, Wu Wei Zi Xi Sandra has a polysaccharide that exerts antitussive effect for both acute and chronic cough. Okay, but in this case, keep in mind that a lot of time, cough is actually a good defensive response, right? So if you have uh, infection, if you have something that goes into the lung that's foreign to the body, your body wants to get rid of it, right? So that's why cough is a defensive response to try to get rid of it. And cough is only bad, let's say, if it's a nighttime that keeps the patient up all night and they cannot sleep. And then if they cannot sleep, obviously their condition will get worse. So it's generally speaking not necessary to treat cough unless it's an acute cough that, that keeps the patient up at night. Or maybe it's a chronic cough that after the infection is gone, after the disease is gone, there is no reason to continue to cough anymore. But what happens is there's underlying damage to the lung, lung indeficiency, lung qi deficiency. So it's an unproductive cough, it's a neurogenic cough. But in that case, you need to nourish in, tonify qi, and then you can add some herb to also suppress cough. Okay, so in this case, which is good if you use it at night for acute cough, or if you use it for patients with chronic cough, okay, where there's a lot of underlying deficiency. So you use herbs that tonify qi, nourish in, and some herb in this case, also to restrain the lung and relieve cough. Okay, Yin Su Ke is one that we mentioned earlier, right? So what happened is Yin Su Ke not only act on the GI tract to stop diarrhea, it also has effect to go to the central nervous system, suppress the cough reflex, and therefore suppress cough. Okay, so once again, uh, this herb has a stringent effect on the intestines and also on the lung. Okay, similarly, opioids, the drugs, are the same. Okay, uh, there are some drugs like, um, you know, a lot of drugs with codeines, they are also used to suppress cough. Okay, so it's not just an analgesic effect that the codeines and the morphines are used, they are also used for both suppressant effect to treat cough and also anti-diarrhea effect to treat diarrhea. All right? And then, Wu Bei Gala Chinensis, like we mentioned earlier, is wax. It has binding effect. So what happened is the tenons in the herb, in fact, will bind to proteins, forms a plug, and actually stop the bleeding that way. Okay, so if the patient has bleeding, has damaged blood vessels, have dilated uh, blood vessels leading to excessive bleeding, then what happened is uh, this is an herb that will bind to the protein, forms a plug, and just mechanically stops the bleeding process. Okay, and then last, lastly, the mineral herb, Zi Si Zi and Yu Yu Niang, also promotes coagulation and stop bleeding. All right, so as you can see, you know, there are a lot of astringent herbs. They have a lot of different TCM and pharmacological effect. And at the same time, how they actually work inside the body to treat diarrhea, to treat cough, to stop bleeding, and so on, are all a little bit different. Okay, so it's not really a one-size-fits-all type of herbs and that TCM effect and also Western indication. You know, if you dive into it, it's actually quite interesting. Ah, last one. Sang Piao Xiao has antidiuretic effect to stop the excessive urination, both in frequency, in volume, and also whether they can control it or not. Okay, so Sang Piao Xiao also has a formula called Sang Piao Xiao San, which is the um, same herb in a formula form, primarily for frequent urination, un in urinary incontinence, and also uh, leakage of sperm.
Okay. Well, another thing that's quite interesting, and this is something that we are just you know uh, finding out in the last few years, is that many of the astringent herb also has excellent anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, so in this case, what happened is inflammation in part occurs when there is trouble, when there is a disease condition somewhere in the body, right? So your body is now, let's say it's an infection or inflammation or physical injury. So your body at this point wants to send all the cells to the disease area to treat the problem. And once the cell gets to the disease area, they cannot get out of the blood vessel and get to the disease area until the blood vessel dilates, right? Blood vessel dilates, increases the hole, so the blood cells can get through, right? So when it dilates, what happens is the blood cells get through, but also a lot, of a lot of the fluids goes out as well. So the fluid that goes out basically will cause a lot of localized swelling and inflammation, okay? So what happens is astringent herb not only treat the leakage of qi and leakage of fluid, like we mentioned earlier, it will actually also cause constriction, okay, and also close, you know, reduce the permeability to treat the excessive swelling and inflammation that way. Okay, so astringent herb, in addition to everything that we talked about earlier, uh, will also reduce the permeability to exert its effect to reduce swelling and inflammation. So that's the anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, so in that regard, you will help within the whole treatment strategy to treat acute lung inflammation, acute lung injury, asthma, lymphoma, leukemia, colitis, and diseases in which there is excessive swelling and inflammation. Okay, so Hertz does that. Hertz has, has an anti-inflammatory anti effect, and it works by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase and phyllopoxy oxygenase. Okay, and these are the, you know, disease indications for asthma, for lymphoma, leukemia, cancer, and possibly autoimmune disease. Ume, fructose ume, also has anti-inflammatory effect. In this case, by acting on the inflammatory cytokines, such as cyclooxygenase and also immunoglobulins. Okay, indications may include gastritis, gout, hepatitis, cholecystitis, prostatitis, and so on. And then with the Shishandra, also do the same thing, uh, specifically by inhibiting the nitric oxide, prostaglandin, cyclooxygenase, and so on. Okay, may be used to treat coughs, silicosis, asthma, allergy, and so on. Okay, uh, so what you can see so far is a lot of the Western disease characterized by itis. Okay, so inflammatory disease. What happened is the inflammation occurred once again as a result of increased basal permeability followed by swelling and inflammation. Okay, so astringent herb does play a role under those circumstances to reduce the basal permeability, especially if it's overboard, to reduce swelling and inflammation. But keep in mind that inflam inflammatory conditions overall are still heat in nature. So when you treat them, you can use a astringent herb as part of the strategy to reduce swelling and inflammation, but make sure the overall formula still have more herb to treat the underlying uh, heat, which is inflammation. So you still need herbs that clear damp heat, that uh, a clear fire, that reduce inflammation, and so on. That way you can treat the symptom, you can also treat the underlying cause. All right, and then lastly, I want to spend just a little bit of time to talk about weizi and its effect to treat the liver, uh, to protect the liver, and treat a lot of artificial, chemical, or drug-induced liver damages. Okay, so liver, once, I mean weizi, once again, has that great astringent effect to help to reduce inflammation, reduce blood vessel permeability, reduce the ability of these chemicals or drugs to get into the liver cell to damage the liver. So you see that quite a bit, and I'll give you these examples. So words has been used quite a bit for treatment of these liver disorders, including, um, let's see, ethanol, which is alcohol, carbon tetrachloride, thioacetamol, and paracetamol. Uh, paracetamol is acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. All these drug substance-induced disorders, 
Okay, so words will help to reduce the liver enzyme, decrease the liver cell necrosis, and prevent liver fibrosis, and also steatosis. Okay, so that's a buildup of fatty acid or fatty tissues in the liver. Weights does it in part by altering the liver cell membrane permeability. So if you have um, toxic substance in the body, it makes it more difficult for these toxic substance to enter the liver cells to damage the liver. And at the same time, weights will also include increase blood flow to the liver to help with the internal repair and regeneration of the liver cells. Okay. Under some circumstances, liver will actually increase the liver's ability and capability to metabolize the toxic substance. Okay, so it's increasing the cytochrome P450 activities. But at the same time, uh, when the liver is under excessive stress for too long, and the liver cells, uh, liver enzymes are elevated for a prolonged period of time, then that's not healthy. So words under those circumstances will also help to lower the liver enzymes and restore it back to normal. Okay, so that means words has a regulatory effect on the liver for treating the liver disorders. Okay. Uh, in this case here, uh, words help to protect the liver from acetaminophen induced acute liver failure. Okay, so in case you didn't know, acetaminophen at low doses is something that the liver can metabolize and process. So generally speaking, within the therapeutic dose, it doesn't cause much problem. But for patients who have pre-existing liver problem, or if the you know, patient somehow take an excess amount of acetaminophen, then it becomes very, very toxic to the liver. Okay, so in that case, um, Shisandra or Wiz is one of the most beneficial herbs to help to treat this acute liver failure due to acetaminophen. Okay. Similarly, it's also great for treating ethanol-induced fatty liver. Okay, so as you can see, words is one of the best herbs to help to stop the acute and also chronic liver injuries. But similarly, like I mentioned earlier, this should not be the only herb used. It should be one of the treatment overall, uh, one part, probably no more than 10 to 20 percent or so of the formula. That way, uh, you need to still use a lot of herbs that treat the underlying DMP of the liver. Okay, so DMP basically refers to a localized infection and inflammation or condition affecting the liver. One other thing that's very important is um, the active compounds in weights to help to treat liver problem is sensitive to heat. Okay, so if you do use this herb for that purpose, it's, you know, if you use the raw herb, then make sure the herb is extracted at um, low temperature, below 60 degrees Celsius. Basically, take the herb, crush it so the you know, outside is open, soak it in warm water, but don't boil it in hot water, and then after that, drink the decoction. Okay, uh, if you use the herb, you can, if you can grind it into powder, that's fine, you can ingest the powder. If you use the herbal extract, then make sure uh, the extract is either extracted at low temperature, or they do some type of a distillation process to recollect the essential oils. You know, basically the compounds that are volatile or compounds that are very sensitive to heat. Uh, there are also products over the counter that use this as a tincture. You know, so the tincture will help to extract those active ingredients. But then keep in mind that the tincture ideally should be completely removed. Alcohol should be removed. Otherwise, uh, the alcohol given to the patient in patients that already have liver problem may then cause its own set of problems. Okay, so once again, you know, if you are using weights to treat liver problems, use it for no more than 10 to 20 percent of the overall formula. Okay, and also realize the active compounds are sensitive to heat, so don't cook it in decoction, don't cook it 100 percent, 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, if you use it in tincture, make sure you remove the alcohol. That way you get the most out of the herb, and then you get the most out of the treatment. All right? This is a formula from Dr. Jimmy Chang. Uh, he calls this a shunjin complex. Basically, it's, in it's a formula with many of the uh, shunjin herbs. 
to be used as a portion of the overall treatment. So once again, uh, to help to astringe, to reduce the permeability, to reduce the excessive swelling and inflammation in any, t any type of infection or inflammatory conditions in which the very vasodilation and swelling and inflammation, instead of being part of the normal healing process, becomes a hindrance to your healing. Because once you have too much swelling and inflammation, it blocks everything else from um, um, happening. Blood doesn't get there anymore. Uh, it causes a lot of localized problem. So basically when inflammation is no longer a healing process, it becomes a disease process, then you need to reduce swelling and suppress inflammation. So this is a formula he found to be most effective as a blend of astringent herb. And once again, you say it's not by itself, but in conjunction with other formulas, that will help to treat the underlying problem. All right, so that concludes my presentation today. And once again, if you have any questions at all, feel free to send a, send a question to Donna or send a question to me directly, and I'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions you have. All right, thank you very much, and have a good rest of the day.